Alrighty, so we're gonna talk about the Toronto scene since you are currently the stand-in for the entirety of Toronto. Oh, Canada! I am Canada. Yeah, yeah you are the Canadian scene right now, George. All of Canada. That's right. Boils Even the British. Trump. The British came back to reconquer Canada. Justin Kill Team. Well, Chan next year. We're coming down my red coats. We're burning down the White House again. <laughs> I mean, you're going to come to the New York Open, right? You're going to try to reinvade. You started Hopefully. your conquest in Toronto, and now it's time Hopefully. to conquer the neighbors across the border. We're actually going to Boston this weekend, so uh, <laughs> be scouting it out. Uh, you're doing. Um, you're doing. What? Well, there's a tournament coming up at the end of April, I think, in the Toronto North, uh, New York, or like upstate New York area, right? Yeah. So I've been chatting with Shane because we're quite local. So him and Ryan and one of their buddies who does the recordings, they're coming up for ours on the fifteenth. Nice. Um, and I, th- I, th- I think we're going to try and go to his. Depends on if I can get someone to drive over with me, because nice. the uh, they they got rid of the ferry, which would have been absolutely perfect. Oh. Um, and the train is six hours, so that might be a bit yeah, it's better than driving five hours. I hold three a train so, six hours. Oh, it's three hours versus six. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, doubles a lot. Yeah, so but hopefully... you could get three rounds of kill team as practice before you or you make it to the actual tournament, so you can prep for the world championships exactly like you right. can do it on the train as well it's like those people playing kill team on the plane yeah but it's just with more space yeah okay. the more the more negative situ- situations you add the better practice it is for the year right if you can play kill team on a train you can play kill team on your 11th game in a row within three days yeah exactly or you could just but boot you- up tts we know how controversial that is I mean, if you play TTS, you're going to be stuck in front of your computer for like almost 24 hours just to play four games, right? TTS is actually kind of fast. Like, I feel like it's been oh, it? a lot of my games have been pretty similar timing wise to real games. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that, Jason. It depends, depends how depends like how well you know the factions, how well your opponent knows the system. Like, you, you can you can, I've had people like put clocks on me and stuff, and you can you can bang out a game in two hours. That's good yeah. to hear. Anyways, George, you're the representative of all of Toronto. How and you've basically been like in, institutional and like building up the scene in your area, right? Yeah. So um, a little bit of background. So I started playing as the edition came out. Um, I was living in Philadelphia at the time, despite the accent. Um, so I was quite lucky. I had a good local scene there. So we had um, the basement war gamers just just outside the city, and um, I was organizing games there with my buddy Sean. Um, in down in Philadelphia itself, uh, so we had like a good night going. So we, that's kind of where I kind of cut my teeth. Then we had um, Kill Team Open in February last year, where I met you, uh, yep. Travis, um, which was really fun. Um, never made out to one of your tournaments, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but I moved to Toronto in July, where there wasn't much of a organized scene. There's lots of little pockets of players. Um, so I kind of got on all the discords. I um, was kind of sending messages, kind of, does anyone play Kill Team? Does anyone play Kill Team? Et cetera, et cetera. And I uh, found a few players. Um, and then I kind of got into this really friendly 40K group who rent a studio every two weeks down down by the lake. Um, and they, they were wanting to like, bring new members in and they were kind of wanting to expand to, to Kill Team. So I've I've slowly been converting them because we joined at quite a good time and there's a bit of a dip of interest in ninth edition. So a lot of the 40k players are quite receptive to learning a new system. Um, so that worked out really well. So I've, I've kind of slowly converting a few of them. So lots of players play both systems now. And yeah, so we, we've been building a scene there ever since. Nice. That sounds like a pretty interesting situation. So your group rents out like a big studio twice a month? Uh, yeah, every two weeks. Uh, sometimes three, th- uh, three times a month, depending on if we're having like a proper seat, a proper um, special event. So sometimes we do like a narrative campaign. Sometimes we do like a kill team event, and other days we do like a competitive forty k RTT. Um, which is pretty Are you nice, guys so. working with a, a shop in your area, or is this all just kind of like someone's love child of creating a scene, and then it has built up over time? Uh, so we have sponsorship now from one of the local stores, but it's uh, two guys, Niall and Phil, who kind of started the thing. So they started playing 40k in their backyards during the pandemic, and um, they're Niall's Irish, uh, Phil's English, which is quite funny. So then we kind of yeah, just 
got along really well and we've just kind of been building the scene ever since um so yeah now our group's pretty good um we got a good group of kill team players there's about um depending on the day there's like four or five tables going on so like a good 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 scene of uh, people who came back which is good that's sweet that story is uh i love that you know renting out the studio by the uh by the water over there that's i love that it's yeah. kind of funny it's in, it's in it's in a bit of a industrial area so kind of when i first went down there i was like what have i got myself into like <laughs> is this the right place it's like it's called the studio district so it's like all these old like kind of film studios and stuff and i was like am i going to get mugs am i going to am i going to am i going to get all my mini stolen like what's going to going on my wife was going to be so mad at me for getting murdered over a game <laughs> I know, and I kind of got there. They're like, "Oh, welcome in!" They're really, really friendly and stuff. So, yeah, it kind of Good worked team. out well. Um, so it sounds but, like you guys would have a lot of games in one day. It's not just like you, people. Do people just play like one game and then leave, or are people playing for like six, seven hours? Because you're only there like twice a month, right? So I tell you what we do, right? So we we start in the morning and we do four hour four hour rounds. And we play four of them. Uh, we're basically preparing for Atlanta, so we do four of them in a row from Friday to Monday four games a day you sounds like a good seriously. use that sounds like a good use of rental time no joking so uh, what will we do we have two sessions so we, we start at nine and we finish at about six or seven um mm -hmm. so we do like sign ups and stuff um so we say everyone who goes knows that they're going to have a an opponent which is like kind of expecting like a similar game which is pretty good um and yeah so i, I also work with or not work but i, I also like collaborate quite a lot with it, my mate jabber um, so we do a regular kill team night, which is kind of focused to be a bit more kind of beginner friendly, um, mm -hmm. every Wednesday at the guild house, which is like a local store. I see. Um, so you, you so, got your local store and your private club. Uh, it's semi-private, so you, you can, you can message me for an invite yeah. if you want. But, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how we do it. So it's kind of two places to play. So we've got like a beginner's night every, every Wednesday, just so people know where to find us. And then any, any, like, and then we have like an organized, um, uh, tournament coming up on 15th for example so we'd be posting that on all our, all our local discords local, local facebook groups and stuff like that so people know to find us if they want to play kill team that, that sounds sweet. really cool yeah how many people do you have signed up for the the next tournament that you've got coming up oh, good question jason so we're on 23 out of 24 currently so there's one more spot so if oh, you haven't made up your cool. mind you listen to this you can get on there quickly but um there will be a waiting list as well if if you're too late is 24 the cap of your uh, studio? Um, it's probably the cap of my TOing abilities right now, because it's just going to be me. Um, but we, we probably could fit a few more tables in if, if people... Uh, you if, better if make it, sure you are 100% uh, on all the line of sight rules, on both in the dark and open. I know, I've got my laser pointer ready. Yeah. There's definitely uh, some cute tricks you can do on in the dark, like uh, making sure you move in the middle of your move and then uh, like leave the door, so... There's lots of there's lots of small things, so who knows? Who knows what players are going to come up with? Oh, are you guys doing only in the dark for this tournament? No, we're, we're doing mixed. It should be pretty good. Yeah. So. Yeah, my advice is to uh, set up all the boards and then just rotate players through the boards as best as you can. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's kind of mostly and what I've been doing, have, too. Yeah, we're going to have like one or two extra boards as well, probably into the dark, so we can mm -hmm. sub them in if people need to um, yeah. not play on the same map twice. Like your overflow map. All right, I would also suggest doing, uh, you know, your missions just go from one to three or randomize it and make sure you don't repeat if you're doing three rounds. That also makes things easy on you. Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing four rounds, actually. So it's going to be like a proper Ooh. proper event. Yep. So, right. yeah, so I think I've rolled them off already. So I think we're doing, I can't remember the exact order. So it's on the oh, you don't want to You don't want to spoil for your players, right? I know. If Did I, you pre-publish the missions? Uh, yeah, the, the, I think it's that. I can't remember. The, I think it's domination, then either loot or secure, and then... Sorry, I capture. So it's B A B C or something. I you can tell that George learned how to play in the first part of this edition. Exactly. I, I, I can't call them not capture loot or. Yeah, I always go like, oh, ground. it's loot. And then it's, uh, you know, seize ground and then domination. And I always have to remember the actual new word. Yeah. It's secure into capture. I think secure is seize ground and capture is domination, which is very annoying. But we've just called them the same thing. The different Throw missions balls at us with all these new terms and all that you know i think they cleaned it up nice with the new mission pack i'm a fan yeah i think outside of 
mass in the dark mass ties i've been pretty happy with uh most of the rules changes biggest the biggest contro controversial one for me was uh the cp change where it's like not really sure if it was going to lead to better games but i think it just leads to more interesting games so yeah it's definitely tighter it's def definitely a way to play around it. i think you've got to be a bit more on top of your secondaries and yes. kind of really getting to know what you can take what your opponent can take and playing yeah. to deny yeah, I think the biggest thing is now a lot of the objectives are way more spread out and way like the no man's land is way easier to ignore. Whereas before a lot of objectives were like in the middle of the board. So you were kind of like forced into interaction. You play way cagier now, which, yep, you know, you either react to or you split the score in half with your opponent and fight over secondaries. So, yeah, it's definitely an interesting packet, you know, and as long as the next mission packet is uh, is another change. I think it's, we've had some talk about, like, is the new mission packet a good thing or a bad thing? And I think, really, instead of that question, it boils down to, like, whatever it is is fine, as long as, like, what was before and what is after is different, because that's what keeps it fresh. Yeah. Exactly. Honestly, the biggest thing, to kind of tie back to building a scene, is uh, just the availability of it. So we've had lots of new players recently, and they, they keep asking me about the, the cards. Um... See, I, I've got two, so I normally share them around. But there's like a lot of players who still don't have them yet, which is uh, something that we certainly need to kind of work yeah. around and something to think of when building a Honestly, scene. Honestly, as a TO, I still don't have access to them, so we're <laughs> we're sent off to handwrite our cards from sources. Yep. Can have the uh, conversions and kind of like local painting, how's it compared to your old scene? Because, you know, in Philadelphia, there's a lot of active, you know, modders or painters. So how's the how's the scene up north? That's oh, good. We've got some really great hobbyists. So um, my group, Maple Leaf Wargaming, um, it's kind of like a hobby and kind of it's very, very chilled. Like it's not, it's kind of competitive when it needs to be, but not kind of like really too competitive. So like a lot, there's a lot of emphasis, emphasis on kind of community building, good sportsmanship and hobby. So we, we've got a really good hobby channel in our Discord and stuff. So we've got some an amazing like terrain builder, Will. We've got some amazing painters as well. So yeah, it's, it's really cool to they definitely keep me on my toes, which is fun. Yeah, I'm not I'm not too surprised. So Jason, afterwards, when you check, take a look at uh, George's minis, we're just quite quite the painter. Oh yeah, I mean, I actually heard about George uh, the day before I met him, where someone else was talking about their friend George and his super cool breachers that were converted to be chaos. And um, then the next day, and this was at LVO, then um, I ran into George and you had talked about your breachers. And I was like, oh my gosh, I heard about you. And I saw them and it was worth all of the hype. I'm very impressed. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's my mate Niall. He's he is the other the other half of uh, Maple the Leaf other, Gaming. Yep. Yeah, the other Maple Leaf, huh? Exactly. Um, so yeah, the, the I'm they're probably the team I'm kind of most proud of at the moment. So I started one of my first teams was um, the old Chaos Compendium team. So I originally started Kill Team as a way of just I thought it'd be like a box game. So I was really into like the Bad Ab Wars when I was like a teenager and stuff. So that okay. Let's do uh, Red Corsairs versus um, Mantis Warriors and just kind of keep it two teams, simple, see how it goes, see if there's anyone to play with. And as you can kind of see, it's kind of uh, escalated a little bit since then. Yeah, it's escalated for all three of us so far. Definitely has. Do you have any, uh, are you still playing Breachers or do you, you know, what team are you looking forward to playing over the next couple months? So I did like Breachers, but I found them a bit, I, I think I like teams with a bit more maneuverability. So I've been playing the Eldari teams recently. So I've, I've been finally giving Corsairs to go. Um, I've been playing quite a bit of Hand of the Archon, um, which, which is definitely interesting. I, I think they're, they're fun to play. I'm not, I'm not sure how I quite feel about them yet after about 10, 10 games in. Um, so I'm probably going to stick with them for a few more games to, to see to see how to see where they kind of end up, I think. Um but yeah, so because I've been teaching, I've, I've been playing all sorts. So I, I kind of wanted to build the breaches as a way of having a horde team. So I could give my local players practice against hordes because I had like the elite sort of my legionaries and my warp coven. And yeah, I wanted something else to kind of practice with to teach people. So yeah, because the final part of our podcast is about niche tactics. So do you have any 
things that you found particularly effective with either Corsairs or Handy the Archon that isn't super well known or that you'd like to share? Uh, so I, I've had quite a bit of fun with the Dark Lance. Um, so it, I, I know this a bit of, it's not, it can be a bit clunky if, you, if, you're not, if you're not used to it, especially with cumbersome and stuff. But I think in certain matchups, like against the Elites, for example, uh, what you can do is last activation of one turn, move dash into position with conceal, line up a shot, and if it gives your opponents some interesting questions the following turn, um, if they've got a dark lance staring down their face, I, I've done that against a legendary player. Especially if you effect. fork the shot. Yes, yes. Damn, so they've got brilliant. a parrot. I love that. Yeah. And I, I also use it as like, a, I also give him the upgraded um, array of blades as well. So I just treat him like a normal Cavalite with decent melee. I'm just kind of run him forward. So he's not your typical heavy gunner. Oh, yeah, man. I actually have heard, I actually have heard that uh, someone uses their heavy gunner as basically a melee piece. And then every once in a while, you get to fire off a shot that your opponent's not ready for. That's how I was yeah, looking uh, at Legionnaires when I was trying to make a... Uh, pure corn legionary roster, which was more of a silly thing than anything. And then, like, they announced world leaders after that, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna lean into that." Uh, never really did, but it's a fun little thing. Um, yes, oh, use, your, the, use the, your gunner like a melee piece. I, I heard people talking before about the uh, the corn melter gunner with the the knife. That just sounded so fun. I've never tried it, but it definitely seems interesting with perpetual aggression. Yes. I think on In the Dark, there's definitely more room for Corn to come out and play a little bit. Because you can rampage through a room without your opponent really having time to react to you. Yep. Also, the, the dash after melee as well, um, after playing Hand of the Archon, can be really strong as well. That's definitely maybe appreciate them a lot more as well. But like the Corn dash lets you get into melee, whereas the Hand of the Archon one doesn't. Or does it? No, it no. does not. No, no. You it's can just, just run away. Death, yeah, except it breaks the rules of uh, you can't do it after a charge. Exactly. Well, you do have to kill your opponent before you can charge, right? You, if you're in engagement range, you can't dash out of engagement range. That's not allowed. No, no cause, yeah, because you, you won't get the token, yeah. which is... Or if you double you, charge... You yeah. haven't just played Hand of the Archon, right? You've played Legionary and Warp Coven. Do you have any other tips that you would share for Warp Coven, maybe? Because I know there's not a lot of players still playing them, but you definitely play them for a while. Yeah, I stuck with them for about a year to kind of learn the game. And as I've kind of been teaching people, I've decided to kind of branch out. Um, I haven't, I've only played one game with the, the new crit ops with them. I decided to retire them a little bit. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure because I, I, a lot of my warp coven play used to be around the, um, the old tack ops, such as, um, what's it called? Plant Banner and the, the tricks you could do with that. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, just, I, I just think warp coven are a really good team if you kind of want to master the kind of fundamentals of the game and kind of get used to reading board states. Yeah, I mean, one of our, one of I think the only game that we've played is when we played Warp Coven versus Pathfinder is oh, relatively yeah. early on. Yep. And I was like pre-spacing for your Flux Blast, so you were just kind of stuck. Yeah, for some reason I thought it'd be a good idea to bring uh, rubrics in the matchup. So I think if if I played it again, I'd probably approach it a bit differently. Bring the uh, yeah. the ten the ten goats with the uh, the one sorcerer. Oh, I've never heard of anyone do ten goats in one sorcerer. I think it was his uh, exact strategy against Pathfinder specifically. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I love that. I feel Just like you've got to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, it... talk, about, talk about the strategy against a melee shooting team. <laughs> so I've, I've, run, I've run two, two sorcerers, eight angles a few times. So that's a bit easier. I, th I, think, I think 110's pushing a bit. But um, I, I think if, if the board allows it and there's quite a bit of heavy cover in the middle, just to keep up with activations and just to kind of like threat overload, I think it could be okay. But it's still not a good matchup. So yeah, what what matchups do you do to Aiden, or what matchups did you do in the past? Kind of like talk through your um, kind of thought process for why you would want to take away a sorcerer. Is it really just around activations, or were there specific matchups where you thought it was good? So it was against the old Compendium Harlequins. I used to run two eights um, just because you could kill them in melee with the charge. Do you think something like that would still work against the newer Void Dancers? Uh, I'd, I'd probably go 3-6. Actually, that, that's the other thing of Warp Coven, actually. So um, speaking of, um, I'd actually probably run six angles the majority of the time and forego the rubrics just to have access to the recon deck. That's probably something that I was, I've been wanting to test. Um, oh, that's true, because the recon deck is now probably the stronger deck between security and recon. Yeah, and I, I, I know quite a lot of the Spanish players are doing that as well. So I think some of the strongest Spanish players are 
are running more Sango heavy lists just so they have access to recon. Um, because like Warp Griffin are like a really weird place where their their faction tack ops don't synergize very well with secure the, the new security ones. Um, so often you're trying to like um, um, score central control early, like turning one, turning point one, turning point two, before you got shot off the board. But now you can't start that until turning point two. Yep. Um, and then you've got grand plan where they with some of the new mission objective layouts, it makes it very very hard to do. It's basically on completely on their side of the board, which is kind of another dead tack up. And then they can play around um, the Scry Secret very easily. But the, what's it called? The Sorcery Fritcher ones, okay. It's probably the best out of the faction types currently, I think. Yeah, because now the, you have so many more objectives, right? Whereas before, sometimes you'd have to pick one that's a little further out. There's almost yeah, always exactly. one close to you now, right? Yeah, it's going to lose and stuff as well. But so I'd still probably take that. But yeah, it definitely depends. I'd definitely try to explore Recon if, if I was playing Warp Griffin more, I think. And were you a player that split up into one of each sorcerer type, or did you find more success with two of one tree and one another? Oh, see, before Into the Dark, I was always one of each, but I actually changed my tune a little bit on that. Um, so I think with the, the change to Exalted Sorcerers and the rubrics choosing twice, um, I think just to be a bit more CP efficient, I started running Double Tempiric. And it's kind of funny because I think when you're running one of each, you become quite reliant on Psychic Dominion, which is the, the ploy that lets you cast two Psychic Powers of the Sorcerers. And I sometimes felt that I'd often want to get more value out of that, like double casting with one or two of them. Even when probably the better move in the game itself would be to move, dash, tap an objective, or charge, fight, tap an objective, and not try to get maximum value out of that. So I think, I think, ironically, by moving away from one of each and kind of simplifying a little bit, I think the double temporary kind of leads to easier decision-making in-game, kind of maybe play better as a result, I think. You're also just allowed to, like, play the killy part a little bit more efficiently because Exalted Astartes is so much more improved, right? Yep. Even the double fight is really good as well. Like I, I, as soon as you start popping it, you kind of start looking for opportunities to do that and stuff, which is pretty interesting. So yeah, the, the, starting... the one... So the, what the one drawback as well is on Into the Dark specifically is that Flux Blast, um, the having Blast can be a bit of a double-edged sword. sword. So I found that sometimes I was actually missing Doom Bolt, not being able to get within two of something and shoot something point blank. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, because you yeah. would blast on yourself now, yeah. whereas before yeah. you wouldn't. That's yeah. interesting. It's an yeah. interesting uh, point. I guess you would also, I guess you have the pistol now, or are you mostly taking Relentless on In the Dark? For your melee profiles, uh, I I always used to take two two relentless and the time walker with the flame pistol, just to give them five attacks, just so you, you hedge. So if you get charged, you still got five attacks to kind of defend yourself. Hmm. But yeah. I, I know I know I know people give time walker the relentless kopesh just to kind of double down on the melee, which is completely valid. I think I think that's better against intercession and kind of more elites and stuff. Yeah, I warp coven is one of those teams where there's a million and a half ways to set up the roster, and they're probably the one of the few teams where the roster is still one of the most important parts of the entire team. Yeah, man, 100%. They're, yeah, fun faction to play, but I do think they're feeling their age now a little bit. I think they could definitely do with a bit of a refresh in the tack ops. Yeah. I, think, I think that's their biggest weakness. Yeah, but you've definitely been enjoying your time with the elves, finding out uh, all the different ways that you can run 9 or 10 inches and shoot someone that your opponent wasn't ready for. Yes, and get murdered turning point one due to, due to bad positioning or being a bit too, uh, a bit too, uh, too aggressive. Yeah. Yes, I think. Uh, is it, is have you to lend found that? any kind of? Uh, I've seen that hand of the archon because they don't have three APL or free mission actions on in the dark. It seems like they could run into a couple issues, like getting through doors or getting like traffic jammed. Have you seen that? Um, I was due to play a game this week on into the dark, but I haven't actually played it yet. So. Uh, I've I've only played on them with open boards, so I I don't know. So I, I think I need a few more games to get back to you on that. But yeah, I definitely think that could be a problem. Like not having access to comms or three APL on demand, like even on open boards, that can be quite kind of restrictive. So you that's definitely something you have to play around. All right, that sounds like uh, all the niche tactics for that we've got in store today. Yeah, we covered a lot of cool, interesting little things there. Thanks, George. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for bringing in some of the Toronto. Hopefully, we can get your last spot filled for that tournament. And I fingers crossed. Any questions? Feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, if you want to join 
George's not so secret semi private club, feel free to message him. There'll be a link for the VCP as well. I'm sure I can send you guys. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we'll we'll crazy. link yours and uh, Shane's upcoming tournament at the end of April. So yeah, well, thank you all for listening. It's been great having you, George. Hopefully, uh, Toronto scene spins up even more in the future. We'll be going to the Toronto Open any day now. Be sure to sketch that, not on the same day as the uh, New York Open.